We are recording. Okay. So um, remember that you need to make sure and watch the lecture videos and take notes. And that information is going to be on the quiz, which is going to be on Wednesday. So remember that there is no class on Monday. But we are having lab this week. So lab, remember, is in ST115 downstairs at 2 o'clock on Thursdays. And um, remember that you want to bring a binder, a three-ring binder, so that you can put your lab notes um, directly into a lab notebook, which you'll turn into me twice during the quarter to get credit for coming to lab. Um, also, um, remember that um, there is a assignment or an assignment um, that's due uh, on Sunday at midnight. And it's like the only assignment that I have on um, Canvas, but it is your introductions assignment. So some of you have already completed that. So if you could get that done by Sunday at midnight, that would be good because then I can review that on Monday before I come to class. Okay. So one of the major topics that we're going to cover um, specifically during the beginning of this quarter, because we're talking about animal diversity. So we're going to go through the major animal groups, starting with sponges and then jellyfish and then moving up to the invertebrates like the, the um, parasites, the planaria, or not par the flukes, the tapeworms, the earthworms, and then just kind of moving along. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about how um, organisms change over time. So that is the definition of evolution. So this is just the change in a group of organisms over time. And so many organisms can evolve um, specific traits that aid them in their ability to survive and to reproduce. So we can talk about these traits as being adaptations. So individuals have adaptations, but in the biological sense, individuals do not adapt. So individuals can acclimate to their environment. So for example, if you went up if you decide you're gonna to move to Denver, which is Mile Hyatt City, for example, you would acclimate by probably producing more red blood cells to deliver oxygen to your body. But that is not the same thing as adapting. So adapt adaptations are what we see in individuals, but populations change. And so the, it's, the term adapt, to adapt is actually at the population level. Okay, so adaptations are any trait that increases the probability that an individual will survive and or reproduce. So it's important to put or reproduce because in some situations, reproduction and adaptations that enhance reproduction could actually decrease the ability to survive. So for example, organisms could have antlers, for example, which um, uh, utilizes energy, makes it more difficult for them to eat and are really heavy. Um, and that actually might make them um, have lower their ability to survive but if a male has antlers, he can actually compete for access to females and increase his ability to reproduce. And so sometimes survival and reproduction are not synonymous. They're, they're actually kind of counterproductive um, in that particular sense. Okay. Okay. So um, we're going to talk about the types of evolution. And microevolution is... Um, referred to as the change in a population. So is it, this is at the population level. So a population is a group of individuals of the same species. So a species from the biological perspective is a individual, two individuals that are capable of reproducing and producing viable, organ, or viable offspring. And so populations are made up of the same species. 
So when we talk about populations, populations can change depending upon their environment. So you could have populations being geographically isolated from one another, and then just by random chances, they could change and over time and become different. So they, the populations could look different. Um, um, so maybe, for example, the northern spotted owl versus the spotted owls that you find in the southern United States, they look slightly different, okay? So that's at the population level. And then we talk about macroevolution. And this is at a larger level. So this would be like speciation. So this would be where you might have an ancestral species giving rise to new species. So new groups of species arising. And it could also be the evolution of major groups. Okay. So for example, the mammals. So if we look far back in the history of the earth, we don't see mammals, but we might see fish. And then if we look at the, so we might find fossilized evidence of, of, of bony fish. And then if we look at rocks that are a little bit younger, we might find amphibians. And then we might find rocks where we have um, the reptiles, including the dinosaurs. And in with the dinosaurs, there might be a few mammal species, specifically very small mammals. And then once the dinosaurs went extinct, that opened up a whole new um, set of environmental conditions. And then we see the evolution of all of the major uh, mammalian groups. And so we could say that the mammals evolved from a reptilian-like ancestor, okay? So that was what I mean by the um, change in a group, a change in the reptiles so that they can give rise to the mammals. One of the really interesting things that they've recently uh, done with the animal uh, tree is, is that they've gotten rid of a separate branch for the birds. So it used to be that we had modern day reptiles and then we had a separate branch off that said the birds. They have now said that birds are reptiles. And so they are not a separate group of organisms. And they're, they have, um, they're obviously their ancestor was um, around um, uh, at, during the age of the dinosaurs as well. Okay, so the example that we're gonna talk about is in the rock pocket mice, okay? And they have a specific adaptation and we're gonna um, talk specifically, or we're gonna look specifically at the genetic components of that variation. And so I have a little handout that I would like you to um, use while you're watching this video. And I'll just give you some feedback. So you're not going to turn this in, but you're going to use it as a study guide. Across the American Southwest, golden deserts dotted by cacti and brush stretch for miles. Yet here in New Mexico's Valley of Fire, the landscape changes dramatically. 
The patches of black rock interrupt the sand, remnants of volcanic eruptions that occurred about 1,000 years ago. The eruption spewed a river of lava more than 40 miles long across the desert. As the molten rock cooled, it darkened, leaving any creature dependent upon camouflage in serious trouble. In the complex battle of life, one of the constant struggles between seeing and not being seen, the evolutionary game of hide and seek. And we've come here to the Valley of Fire in New Mexico, a battlefield, to find one of the tiniest soldiers and what it can teach us about how evolution works. On the desert sands, the rock pocket mouse blends in perfectly, its light colored fur concealing it from predators. But on dark lava, the same fur makes the mouse stand out, attracting the many creatures that see it. These mice are the Snickers bar of the desert. They're eaten by foxes and, and coyotes and, and rattlesnakes, and certainly by owls, and maybe even occasionally hawks. And most of those predators are visual predators. So what happened to the pocket mice that found themselves on this new terrain? When I accompany biologist Michael Nachman onto the lava, it doesn't take long to find out. Nachman has been collecting mice unharmed in traps. And it's a dark one. It is. Yeah. Now, are most of the ones you find up here dark? Almost all of them. Not only have the mice here evolved to be as dark as the mice, the color change has occurred precisely where it will conceal them from hunters. Now, a bit of a white underbelly, too. That's right. All of the dark ones here in our other lava flows have a white underbelly, and presumably there's no selection for dark on the belly because yeah. predators are coming to them up. Left to themselves, the mice show no preference for light or dark rocks. It's the predators that have made the difference. The change in color over evolutionary time in the population is driven by predators weeding out the mice that don't match their background. But how did the dark mice arise in the first place? And when a black mouse appears in a light population of mice, that is usually going to be due to a new mutation. And those are random and rare events. To fully understand the pocket mouse transformation, Nachman moves from the lava to the lab. He and his team extract DNA from light and dark mice to take it from one desert region. The aim? Find one or more genetic mutations that cause dark coloration. A mutation is a change in the chemical letters that make up our genes. It's a copying error that may occur when our cells divide. Mutation seems to mean that something bad is happening. Well, mutations are neither good or bad, whether they are favored, or whether they are rejected, or whether they're just neutral, depends upon the conditions an organism finds itself. So for the pocket mouse, a mutation that causes a mouse to turn black, that is good if you're living on black rock, and it's bad if you're living out in the sandy desert. The white mice are all on the bottom, here and here. Fur color is a trait controlled by many genes. We figure out how dark mice evolve, not then focuses on how these genes differ in dark and light mice. One by one, the genes prove identical, but at last, something does turn up. The difference between dark and light mice boils down to a difference of four chemical letters in a gene called MC1R. Because the gene controls the amount of dark pigment in a mouse's hair follicles, a mouse with these mutations grows dark fur, which gives it an advantage on a dark background. But still, that's one mouse. How did its dark fur spread to a whole population? This lava flow is about a thousand years old. And so you might wonder, is has there been enough time? It's only been a thousand years, it's a very short period of time, for a new mutation to come along and spread so that all of the mice on this lava flow are black, because really they all are. Indeed, 
such a rapid spread of the mutation may seem unlikely until you do the math. And the reason is that while only one new mouse born in 100,000 may be black, hundreds of thousands of mice are born in any given year. And then those mice that are black have enough advantage that their babies do better and they have more offspring and their offspring have more offspring. And just about a 5% advantage compounded year in and year out can very quickly turn the whole population black as we see today. If dark color gives mice a 1% competitive advantage and you start with 1% of the population being dark, in about 1,000 years, 95% of the mice will be dark. If instead, the dark color gives them a 10% advantage, then it only takes 100 years. Thanks to Nachman's mice, science has an example of evolution crystal clear in every detail. What's exciting about this is that we have a system that's very simple ecologically. You have dark rocks, you have light rocks, you have dark mice and light mice. It couldn't be simpler. We know who the predators are, who the selected force is. We know precisely the genetic basis of what makes the mice have an advantage or a disadvantage depending upon where they live. All the pieces are finally together. It's a perfect illustration of Darwin's process of natural selection. In fact, it's more than that. For Nachman's mice also counter a common misconception that evolution is a random process. Well, there is one random component, and that's the process of mutation. Mutations occur at random throughout our DNA. Every new organism is born with a new set of mutations. But while mutation is random, natural selection is not. Natural selection sorts out the winners and losers. And that's really what all the process of evolution is driven by. But if natural selection is not random, would it produce the same result under the same conditions? It does. And here's proof. Rock pocket mice collected by Nachman from other lava flows in other parts of the Southwest. These are two different black mice that are each of all on different lava flows. And the lava flows are hundreds of miles apart. But the changes, the genetic changes that made these mice black uh, were different in each case. And what's amazing to me is how similar the black mice are we didn't know when we started this whether we would find that there were the same genes or different genes and, and we were really surprised to find that they were completely different genes and yet if you look at the mice they look almost identical clearly there are different genetic ways to make a mouse dark but once the beneficial mutations appear natural selection the non-random part of evolution can under very similar conditions favor very similar adaptations in effect, each of these lava flows is like rewinding the tape of life and allowing evolution to occur again and again. In each case, we find the dark mice have evolved. The rock pocket mice show us that evolution can and does repeat itself. And why evolutionary change is never ending. As environments transform, so must the species that inhabit them. Adapting and readapting in the great and complex battle of life. lights on so we can look at our sheets of paper a little bit better. Okay, so what did people put for defining a mutation? Right. So the important thing is, is it that it is a random. It's a rare event, but it does happen. So the really interesting thing about this is, is that during our reproduction, during the cell division, uh, mutations do arise relatively commonly, right? And it's believed that actually every individual is born with about 50 new mutations. 
Now, most of these mutations are in parts of our DNA that do not code for anything. So we think that only about 2% of our genetic material actually codes for protein, actually determines what we are. And the rest of it, we don't really know what it does. Some of it is uh, genetic material that is controlling, kind of master control genes that control and regulate the turning on and turning off of other genes. But some of it might just not have a function. And so the important thing is, is that random changes do occur in our genetic material, and specifically in the sequences of bases. So if you took biology 211, you know that we have in our genetic, in the DNA, we have four bases, which are A, T, C, and G. And the sequence of which those are, are found determines the types of proteins that are produced, right? So if you get a change in the sequence, then you're going to get a change in the protein. So the appearance of dark colored uh, volcanic rock caused the mutation for black fur. Is that correct? False. False, right? So it's really a misconception, probably borne out by scientific, uh, or scientific fiction sci-fi movies, that we evolved towards a goal, right? So that we mutate towards a goal. But really, mutations, because they are random, they are not goal-oriented. So they can be bad, they can be good, or they could just be neutral. So the thing that is not random is natural selection. So natural selection, if the gene causes a benefit like camouflage, it is going to be selected for. And if it's a mutation that causes the organism to be weaker, for example, it will be selected against. Okay. So what kind of gene was mutated to cause the dark coloration? It was a mutation that it was actually, you know, they didn't say this in, in the um, video, but it's actually a control gene that regulates other genes that produce pigment. So it's a control gene that regulates the amount of pigment that is produced. Okay. So some genes don't produce a protein, but rather they um, turn on and turn off other genes. And that is uh, kind of a little bit discussed in the online um, lectures. That's what I talked about. Okay. Okay. The same mutation could be advantageous in some environments, but deleterious in others. How would you write that? True. That's true. Right. So, say a white-colored mice just happened to migrate. You know, these mice are migrating. Um, they're dispersing, so the offspring move out from where they're born and move into new environments, and say a white colored or light colored mouse moves into the dark environment, that would be deleterious, right? But when it's light colored on sand, that is advantageous. And the same thing, if those dark mice try to migrate and set up camp off of the lava flow, which I'm sure they do, right? They don't know that they need to stay on the lava flow, they just leave, and then they would be selected against. Can dark coloration evolve twice in two separate species? Yes. Yes. And so there were two different populations that had different mutations that gave the exact same characteristic. Right? Okay. Are dark and light colored mice different biological species? No. Okay. So this is an example of microevolution. It's not an example of speciation yet, but if you could think if for, for something, if something just randomly changed in that dark population that prevented them from interbreeding with light colored mice, then they could pe become different species, but they're not different species yet. Okay, so we are going to get into groups of two or three, and everybody wants a copy of this handout. And I want you to just, you're going to need, hopefully, have a cell phone with a calculator on it because you're going to need to calculate frequencies here. So we're going to compile some data, the rock pocket mice. Rows are hard to. I'll be right back.
So you need to add them. Yes. So we here we have a life and a light, so that's eight. Here we have a life and a light that's eight. Or is that six? That's six. So you add you to add those up. And then you look at light on a light that's thirty-four. So it's six, eight, and thirty-four. And you would put that on um, substrate color. It's light and the mice are light. So you're gonna put the so you just want to add up the numbers and put them in that table, which is going to make it a lot easier for you to actually look at the data and see what is going on.
Okay, so this first question is light questions. We have 120 divided by 
Okay, so which colors seem to have the overall selected advantage? Dark, right? So even on the white, they do have a little bit of a chance to survive, even if they wandered off onto the light substrate. And then the dependent variable would be mouse color, but also the number of mice. So the number of mice of each color. And then your independent variable would be your substrate color. And then what would possibly be a control variable? Number of mice that you would like to make it for. Um, so yes, so maybe, but that would be hard because what if the density of mice were different on the light versus the dark color? So maybe you would want to um, do it at the same time of the year. Mm -hmm. And you might want to um, uh, trap the same way, right? So if you're going to set out traps, it would be you would want to do it the same for the dark substrate versus the light substrate. You'd want to set up the traps with the same density, um, maybe the same amount of traps might affect it. Okay. Are there any questions about that? Okay. Okay. So let's move on to our next topic. So when we're talking about animals and the, and the organisms in the kingdom animalia, we tend to group them based upon shared characteristics. So um, one way that we could, one assumption that we could make is, is that organisms that have structural similarities are closely related evolutionarily, and animals that look very different from each other would be um, not closely related, right? So one way that we could go about determining evolutionary relationship is looking at structural similarities. So this could be like structure of the skeleton, maybe the structure of the arms. In mice, it could be the teeth, the structure in the teeth. And actually, a lot of times when we're trying to determine mice and organisms of mammals, a closely related species, we might look at actually one structure that seems to vary between um, species is the structure of what is called the os penis or the baculum, which is the structure in the male that gives the rigidity to the penis. So that might be something that we would look at to determine similarities. In damselflies, it's the same thing. They look at the structure of the penis in a damselfly or a dragonfly, and they compare it across different groups to see how similar it is, okay? Now there's a problem with looking at structural similarities alone. And so if we look at two organisms like here, this is a sugar glider and this is a flying squirrel. And we actually have the northern flying squirrel here. Um, so upriver, they tend to uh, stay in the pine trees and they can jump from one pine tree to another and use this flap of skin between their forearm and their hind limb to kind of float, right? To glide from um, one tree to the other. And sometimes they do come down to the ground and they primarily eat lichen. So they'll come down and feed on the lichen during the night and then go back up into the tree. So you generally don't see them very often. Um, the sugar gliders, however, you notice they look very similar to the um, uh, species. But if you notice where they are located, one is in Australia and one is in North America. So what type of mammals do they typically have in Australia that we do not have here? Kangaroos, which are examples of marsupials, right? So Australia is known for its marsupials, and the sugar glider is a marsupial. So this, our flying squirrel, is called a placental mammal, right? And they diverged a long time ago. 
And so even though they're, they look similar, they are not similar. So does anybody know what it is called when two differently related organisms evolve to have similar structural structures? Yeah. Yes. So it's called convergent evolution. So I'm going to put problem here with looking at structural similarities. So con means coming together. And so this means that two un or two distantly related, they're not completely unrelated, two distantly related organisms evolve to have similar structures. It also depends upon what structures we're looking at, right? If we looked at the sugar glider's reproductive tracts, you know, and we, we looked at the way that it reproduces, it be, would be very different because marsupials are known to produce very undeveloped offspring, and those offspring attach to nipples, and they do most of their development outside of the female's reproductive tract. So that means that we have to look at something beyond structural similarities. So another thing that we can look at, it is what is called biogeography. So bio obviously means life and geography means location. And so this is the distribution of the organisms in the environment. And Darwin was noticed, noted for his um, looking at biogeography and recording it, specifically when he went to the Galapagos Islands off the, co coast of, uh, off the coast of South America. So what he noticed is when he did that is he found different species located on different islands. And so um, his thought was is, is that they might have uh, migrated to those islands and then diverged in their structure. So biogeography. So generally, organisms that are closely related tend to be more closely located, right? So if they're close together, if they're found near the same place geographically, we might assume, we might make the assumption that they are more closely related evolutionarily, right? So the third thing that we could look at is, is that we could look at fossil evidence. And people who study fossil evidence um, have a specific name, and these are called paleontologists. Paleo. That's not right. You spell that. Is it right? Oh. I can't. I don't know how to spell that. <laughs> Does anybody else know how to spell it? I want to write paleo. This is really embarrassing. Tology. I know there's a paleo ontology, isn't it? Anyway, yeah, that wouldn't be on the test. That's not on the quiz. There's an in there somewhere. Okay, so we look at fossil evidence. So one of the important things. Yes. It's a P A L E O N T O. Okay, I knew there was an end in there. Haley ontology. There we go. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for putting me out there. Okay, so fossil evidence. So when we look at the fossil history in rocks, right, what tends to happen is, is that you get layers, right? The layer that is closest to the surface tends to be the youngest layer, right, in of the rocks. Oops, youngest, that's a U. And this is oldest. So as you move down through the rock layers, the rocks become older. And this specifically, when we have sediments laying one upon the other. So if you think of like an old ocean bed, right? Um, and then sometimes these rocks get uplifted and you'll find on the top of mountain peaks, you'll find seashells, right? And so they assume then that at one point in time, that rock layer that is at the top of the mountain 
used to be in a shallow sea. And then we have plate tectonics bringing those together and uplifting the rocks, right? So when we look at the fossil record, we sometimes see changes. So organisms that were not that are not around now were at some point found in the fossil history. So if we look at an example of this, okay, this is um, the evolutionary history of the um, cetaceans. And so this would include the whales and the dolphins. So if you look at of the species of the group of mammals that are around today that are more closely related to the whales and the dolphins, it would be the hippopotamus. So in this particular evolutionary tree, all of these lines that do not make it here, right, are extinct. So the hippopotamus and the dolphins and the whales are present day. All of these are species that are only found in the fossil history, right? So what we see um, early on is we see um, a, a organism that is terrestrial, right? And then becomes more aquatic. And so this is called, that one that I underlined is called ambulocetus, which technically means the walking whale, okay? So that lived in shallow seas. And then you notice that they progressively become more aquatic. So mammals evolved on land and then subsequently returned to the aquatic environment and then changed over time. So we see changes over time in the fossil record. Okay. Okay, before we want to go to there, I want to write a couple more. Let's go here. Okay, so the fossil record is important. And then finally, the fourth way that we can determine evolutionary relationships, that's number four, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, okay. Is we can look at molecular evolution. Actually, there's a fifth way I need to write down there, so I'll write, I'll, I'll, there's one more. So this is the, um, we as scientists, as, as human scientists, we have been revisiting all of the relationships that we um, derive from biogeography and the fossil record and also similar structures. And um, we have been reanalyzing them, looking at molecular evolution because now we have the technology to do so. And so, for example, of this would be looking at DNA sequences. The more similar the sequences, the more, the more closely related. So in a little while, I'm gonna give you uh, a evolutionary history of animals. And it is the most recent one that has actually been redone a little bit based upon what we now know about molecular evolution. So we can actually look at, take DNA, we can find the sequences that are significant and we can look at how they change over time. Okay. The fifth one is looking at development. And the reason why development is important is, is that it doesn't change very often. And so one of the things that we say about development is, is that it is evolutionarily reconstrained. So this does not change very often. So when we look at the uh, development of vertebrates and we look at the way that, it, that, it, that we develop, we all start off as single-celled organisms and then we develop into this multicellular organism and we develop a spinal cord and that development of the spinal cord is evolutionarily constrained. It looks the same at that early stage of development, no matter whether you're looking at a fish or a human. 
So all the vertebrates during their development have a standard sequence at which development proceeds. And so when that development changes, then we can get changes, um, but we kind of assume that if there is a change in development, that it is significant, right? So because it would be, it would cause, it would be, it generally it separates groups, okay? And I'll give you another, I'll give you an example of that in a minute. Okay. So when we look at evolutionary relationships, we can build phylogenetic trees. And another name for this particular type of phylogenetic tree is a cladogram. And you don't need to write all these out, okay? Because we're actually gonna work with these cladograms. But I wanted to point out that each of these is a correct way of drawing it. So this one is just flipped this way, right? This doesn't look like a tree, it kind of looks like a tree on its side, right? This one is more tree-like, this middle one. And then this one gives the same information as the other one. It's just drawn a little bit different, okay? So one of the things that you'll notice about these phylogenetic trees is, is that they have certain groups um, are more closely um, connected, right? and are more closely related because of the way that the cladogram is drawn. So if, let me just draw one so we can draw one. Oops. This is kind of, actually just draw this one because this is kind of the, the way that your textbook um, uses the cladograms. So these are the modern groups. So I'll put modern day groups. So notice how they all, these are the ones that we're interested in. They haven't gone extinct. They're all present day groups. These little, uh, uh, what do I want to call? I know what they're called. These are called nodes. And these are called branches. Okay. So branches that are connected by a node represent more closely related organisms. So for example, in this, in this phylogenetic tree, A and B are more closely related than A or C. So generally what that means is, is that there has been a dramatic divergence in um, the characteristics that these organisms um, have. And so um, if I were to write a characteristic here, versus here. So I'm gonna put a line here, and I'm gonna put a line here, okay? So here we would have the ancestral trait. So this would be an ancestral trait. And so what that means is A, B, C, and D all have this trait, okay? So this could be like a vertebra, right? So we could put vertebra. Right there. Okay. What that means is, is that E lacks a vertebra, vertebrae, right? So it does not have a vertebral column. And then here, here we could put hair. Okay. So that trait right there is called a derived trait. And I know I made this kind of messy, but this is called a derived traits, right? So what group of vertebrates have hair? Mammals, right? So we would put mammals here. Here we could put uh, reptiles. Oops, reptiles, right? So reptiles have a vertebrae, but they do not have vertebrae, but they do not have hair. Okay, so this could be mammals and reptiles. What could we put down here? Something that has a vertebrae, right? We could put fish, so we could put bony fish. And then we could put cartilaginous fish. And then here would be something without a vertebrae, which would be what? What could we put there? Sponges, but even maybe butterflies. Okay.
So bony fish and cartilaginous fish have fins. So that could be a trait that we could put there that mammals and reptiles do not have, okay? So in this particular example, I would say vertebrae are ancestral. Hair is a derived trait. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Now, the interesting thing about the, this um, uh, taxonomic and not taxonomic, but phylogenetic trees is, is that you can rotate the branches and it gives you the exact same information. So this will be significant, like if you're, um, one of the things I'm gonna have you do is create cladograms. And if your cladogram looks a little bit different than your neighbors, it could actually be correct, right? Because it could actually be the same. So this has the same information. So Z and Y on each of these is more closely related than Z and X, okay? So there's more than right, one right answer when you are drawing your cladograms. Okay, I'm gonna skip. Actually, you know, this is a really interesting one. I'm gonna go back. Okay, so this is actually one of my favorite examples of evolutionary relationships. So of the elephants today, right, there are three different species that are around today. You notice that the mammoths have gone extinct, right? But the mammoth is more closely related to the modern day mammals, or excuse me, elephants, than it would be to some of those weird shaped ones, like the shoveler, it's got the big long jaw with the sticky teeth out, which they think just kind of shovel vegetation into its mouth, right? So I'm not sure how this one um, fed. This one is kind of bizarre. But one of the things that they all have in common is, is that they have tusks. And they also have foot pads. So they have special types of pads on their feet. And so when we go back to um, the uh, most closely related um, a group of animals to the elephants, we find that these are the manatees. Okay. And the other more close or closely related are what are called the rock hy hyraxes. Okay. So one of the cool examples of how indigenous beliefs can be kind of translated into evolutionary relationships is, is that the um, Maasai of Africa, where the rock hyraxes reside, actually believed that the rock hyraxes were um, miniature elephants that were created when they got in trouble with their creator. And um, they chopped off their nose so that their nose becomes, became smaller and they shrunk them down. So the rock hyraxes are actually, were thought to be, be related to the elephants by the um, indigenous Maasai. And this is all based upon molecular evidence. And so we now kind of have um, structural evidence, but also molecular evidence that puts, puts the hyraxes near the manatees and near the elephants. And so kind of the cool thing about these rock hyraxes is that they have these foot pads that look kind of like an elephant's foot pad, but they also have these tiny little tusks, right? But their nose is not long. So their nose and their upper lip have not been fused during embryonic development to form the trunk. Okay. So now when we're creating evolutionary relationships, we need to pay attention to parsimony. And parsimony is essentially the, the most simplest explanation is the best, right? The, the simplest um, explanation. Um, so this means that the relationship that involves the least number of evolutionary events occurring is probably the one that is correct, okay? so the simplest explanation is most likely
to be correct. Okay, so the least number of evolutionary events are needed to explain the relationship. So for example, draw just a really simple cladogram here. And we could be talking about the relationship between fish and um, let's use sea stars and reptiles. Okay, so here we would have, so this is just kind of a silly example, but it explains it well. So this is my root node here, okay? So all of these are animals, right? But when we look at the major events here, right, we would put the vertebrae, vertebrae here, and vertebrae here, right? So you'll notice that there is a simpler explanation. Right, so I could rearrange these so that it looks like this. Reptiles, and then I have only one evolutionary event to explain, right? So this one, this cladogram, this evolutionary tree is more parsimonious than this one. So this is less parsimonious than this one, okay? So there are fewer evolutionary events that I need to describe. But this really all depends upon what characteristics you think are significant, right? But obviously reptiles and fish also share other characteristics um, that sea stars don't. Okay, so we're gonna talk about what is referred to as EVO-DEVO, and this is short for evolutionary development. And this is the idea that we can change development and changes in early development um, can be used to explain relationships, but can also be used to describe why there is a change in a structure or, or over time. And so in the lectures that you might watch or that maybe you've already watched, I gave you some examples of what are called control genes um, that are called master control genes. And these regulate different stages of development. So they turn on and off other genes. And so if we have a change in a master control gene, we might be able to change a whole structure. So for example, we could go from having an insect that has four wings like a butterfly and then if we switch a master control gene, maybe it would go down to having two wings. So we've completely lost a set of wings, which seems like a big evolutionary leap, but it is only due to a change in a single gene. So for example, flies have only one set, two wings, and they are be believed to have evolved from an ancestor that had four wings, okay? So these are uh, the master control genes. So we're gonna look at them in the Galapagos finches, which have been studied extensively. Um, 
because of the diversity. Oops, did I go the wrong way? Because of their diversity. And notice that one of the things that has changed over time in them is the structure of their beak. So the structure of their beak seems to be related to um, what they eat. So if they're nuts, if they eat um, seeds or nuts, they have a bigger beak. And then if they're insect um, eaters, they would have a nice, delicate, fine beak that would be useful for plucking insects out of the air. So their beak has changed over time. So we're going to watch a short little video that talks about some research into the development genet developmental genetics of uh, these finches and how a change in a single gene might be able to be explain the change in the beak. If switches can play such a profound role in the different I need to turn this up, sorry. From many spots to spikes to hind legs. What is throwing those switches in the first place? Can you guys hear that? Researchers would see the answer in animals very familiar to Darwin. Arkat Abjanov and Cliff Tabin have spent years trying to find out exactly how those Galapagos finches got their different beaks. Their starting point was what they had learned from Darwin himself. Their beaks were vital to the bird's survival. On an island where the main food was seeds, finches had short, tough beaks for cracking them open. On an island where the main food was from flowers, Birds had long, pointy beaks for sucking up nectar and pollen. And they knew something else. The finches are born with their beaks fully formed. So the answer to why they had such different beaks must lie in something that happened to them as embryos in the egg. Something amazing is happening inside those eggs. Genes are turning on and turning off. And depending on exactly how they turn on and off, will determine what type of finches form. To find out just what was going on, the researchers first had to collect some eggs. There she is. It's you know, just like that. Yeah, just the eggs. It's very likely that Jordi has a clutch. Great. She's coming out. Abjanov checks a ground finch nest and finds a single egg. He won't remove it because the mother might abandon the nest. Another nest already has three eggs. He takes one for his research, as he knows the mother will lay a replacement. The team collects several eggs with embryos at different stages of development. That way they will be able to chart exactly how the different beaks grow. Back in the lab, they can begin the process. This cactus finch embryo is well on the way to its signature long pointy beak. And this ground finch embryo is growing a short thick beak. What we wanted to do was try and understand the genes that were involved in making the beak the way it was making a big, broad, thick beak different from a long, thin beak or a short, thin beak. They concentrated on a group of genes known to control the growth of birds' faces. As they looked, they saw something intriguing. One particular body plan gene became active in the ground finch with the short, thick beak on the fifth day of development. But it didn't go to work in the cactus finch with its long, slender beak for another 24 hours. This was a revelation. The same genes were responsible for the beaks in all types of finch. Any differences were in timing and intensity. We got it. We nailed it. It's the same genes in making a sharp, pointy beak or a big, broad, nutcracking beak. What's essential 
What makes the difference and all the difference is how much you turn a gene on, when you turn it on, when you turn it off. And the revelations didn't end there. There was something special about this gene. Like all body plan genes, it doesn't actually make the stuff of our bodies. It didn't make the cartilage for the finch's beaks. It throws switches. And the switches then turn on or off the genes that do make the beak. These are a different type of gene. They're genes that boss other genes around. Scientists now realize that not all genes are created equal. Some make the stuff of our bodies, and switches are needed to turn many of these stuff genes on and off. The body plan genes are what throw these switches, which tell the stuff genes what to do and when. This subtle choreography can have profound effects on how different animal bodies are formed. And this knowledge is helping us solve perhaps the biggest Darwinian puzzle of all, the mystery of the great transformations. It all goes back to Darwin's idea of the tree of life.